If you remember zooming around Hogwarts, hanging your fellow students upside down, and mixing a ton of potions, then you grew up playing Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. But which one? Because there were nine different versions of this game, and in this video we're going to compare all of them. Released in 2009, the Half-Blood Prince built on the framework established by its predecessor. The Order of the Phoenix game was a return to open world exploration, with a big focus on implementing the most authentic Hogwarts experience. But it kind of turned out to be a walking rejection simulator. Alright, go and play with the mudblood. So, would Half-Blood Prince bring back the adventure gameplay that fans craved from the older games, or would this just be another fetch quest riddle tie-in? Well, let's get straight into it. As always, we're going to set the benchmark with the flagship versions, which in this case were released for the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC. And straight away you'll get the menu, where Harry's just standing there watching you. I guess they were trying to show off the high-res character models? Or maybe this is an homage to Super Mario 64. Also, I can't help but feel judged as I navigate the menus. Seriously, you're gonna play the game with inverted controls? Just like The Order of the Phoenix, this game also starts with a set of pre-rendered cutscenes and newspaper articles. Harry then finds himself at the burrow, where Ron immediately shoves a broomstick in his hand. This almost seems like the developers saying, listen, yeah, we realize we didn't have any flying in the last one, now shut up and fly through those stars. And the flying mechanics have been lifted directly from the Goblet of Fire game, which means it's kind of on rails, so no matter how hard you try, you can't actually crash into the barn. As you can see, they've reworked the characters' faces in this game. Harry's and Ron's faces look decent, but there's something off about their hair. I mean, Harry looks like he should be in a K-pop band, and Ron just looks like he's wearing a cheap party wig. And then you get to Hermione. When did you get here? You see, in this game, the role of Hermione will be played by a 30-year-old receptionist from Guildford. Moving on, the wand-wiggling spell gesture mechanic is back from the last game, but it has been improved. Harry's arm is no longer made of rubber. He just has a wandering wrist sometimes. Alright, with the tutorials done, we're off to Hogwarts, which remains mostly unchanged from the last game. There are a few new additions like the Quidditch pitch, but a couple of sections from the Order of the Phoenix, like Moaning Myrtle's bathroom and the trophy room, have been removed. Unfortunately, you can't have one sentence conversation with the NPC students anymore. Okay, Harry. Hey! They just make strange noises when you bump into them now. <laughs> However, the most important gameplay mechanic is still intact. Something else that's intact is the copious amount of walking. But Harry can now run fast. And I'm not joking, look, he's literally entering the speed force. This feature is great, I just wish it didn't zoom right into Harry's head. And speaking of walking, because Hogwarts is such a maze, the last game had you set a waypoint on the map and then you would just follow the footsteps on the floor. It was a nice nod to the Marauders map, but the footsteps often lagged behind or they were just difficult to see on different surfaces. This game scraps the footstep system altogether. Instead, every time you've got to go somewhere, just press the select button and nearly headless Nick will appear and guide you to your destination. And he's not just a glorified waypoint, Harry's interactions with Nick are context sensitive. So the two of them will have different dialogue depending on the quest you're doing and where you need to go. And you can also ask him for hints if you're stuck. You don't know how I can join this potions club, do you? Well, I'd hazard a guess you could sign up on the notice board over there. Another new bit of gameplay is the potion making, which involves you mixing a bunch of ingredients while being timed. It starts pretty chill, just pour some fairy liquid in and tickle the cauldron. But before you know it, you've got a bunch more ingredients and the clock is ticking. Are you consistently shit? Look at yourselves in the mirror, because it's a f***ing disgrace. You're cooking in a burnt pan, you f***ing dick! The dueling system from Order of the Phoenix also makes a return, although thankfully it's been enhanced. It's a lot more responsive this time, and you can actually see how much health you and your opponent have. But it's not the most intricate battle mechanic. Most of the time you can just corner your opponent and then spam spells like machine gun rounds. So the main characters have a pretty good level of detail, but the same can't be said about the NPCs. They also gave the NPCs really big pupils, so they all look like they have these shark eyes. As I mentioned, Quidditch is pretty simple. It carries on the Harry Potter time game tradition of flying through circles, but I welcome it. It acts as a nice break between walking and potion mixing. When's the first practice, Harry? Just look at the notice board. The practice sessions are on there. 
What? It, it's empty. Oh, looks like Ginny needs some help. I've got to write two essays and make a shrinking solution for homework. I'll make the shrinking solution for you. Simp! Okay, let's make the shrinking potion for Ginny. Whoops, drop the worm. Come on. Duh. I've made that shrinking solution for you. Shall we go to Hogsmeade? Oh, sorry, Harry. I've arranged to go with Dean. By the way, I didn't add that record scratch in. And I must say, this game does have a few of these really nice comedic bits. Leave this to me. I'm feeling pretty confident. I do love the Quidditch uniforms in the Hufflepuff Prince. They really make Harry look like he belongs in Whitesnake. So Harry then gets invited to Slughorn's party, where the old man asks him to mix some cocktails. You know, it's your usual party cocktail, just throw in whatever's lying around. We've got orange slices, salt, pepper, absinthe. Hey, I'm pretty sure this is how Homer ended up inventing Flaming Moe's. Okay, so we get some more plot. Uh, the trio suspecting Malfoy's up to something. They go back to the burrow for Christmas, where Bellatrix sets the whole place on fire. You then duel her a couple of times and then we're back to Hogwarts. Right so this Levy Corpus spell breaks the dueling completely. You can just cast it on your opponent and then spam Expelliarmus. My favorite part of the game has to be when Ron accidentally drinks the love potion and then you actually get to play as him for a little bit as he struts through the castle. <laughs> So Harry then drinks the Felix Felicis potion, which is followed by this great first person section that's entirely on rails. So we get to Slughorn and make another potion for him. Well, I say potion, you just throw some shit in a cauldron and stir it a couple of times. Shall we try it, sir? We then meet Hagrid, who's holding a eulogy for Aragog. Hmm, there's something off about the Hagrid in this game. He kind of has the consistency of those chocolate Santas you get at Christmas. Next, Harry gets detention and you play as Ginny instead. Let's look at the notice board for the warm-up Harry's planned. Hmm, doesn't look like Harry's planned much, has he? Wait, is that Cho? Oh, come on, I want to see the rest of her face. What happened? Um, Madam Hooch, I don't think this is fair. The Ravenclaw team has three Seekers. Okay, so we're finally on to the last part of the story. You know, the one where Harry goes to the Horcrux cave with Dumbledore, and somehow they end up on an episode of The Hot Ones. Don't. Don't make me. Make it stop. Please. Make it stop. Water. Water. So this entire section is actually told through cutscenes, which is a real shame because I was kind of expecting them to do another mini game. You know, tap A repeatedly to force feed Dumbledore the poison. It'll stop, but only if you drink. In fact, these cutscenes go on for such a long time, I didn't realize when I finally had a chance to play the game again. Oh shit. Oh shit, 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 shit. Hold on, isn't this just Space Invaders? I think this section is a bit of a foreshadowing for the next two games. Games, just spam spells like machine gun rounds. Okay, so they get back to Hogwarts, Snape kills Dumbledore. Snape kills Dumbledore. Yay! Harry chases the Death Eaters and duels a bunch of them. Well, I'm using the term duel loosely here because it's mainly this. And that's it. After the credits roll, you find yourself back at the grounds. So what do I do now? Better ask Nick. Where are you off to now? So Malfoy's a Death Eater, Snape betrayed and murdered Dumbledore, they almost burned down the school, and Voldemort has split his soul into seven pieces, which I have to find and destroy to actually kill him. So, um, can you help me with that? Oh, oh Harry, Harry, I'm afraid I'm you're fucked. There is a post-game, but it mainly consists of collecting shields and badges by getting a high score in the potions or the Quidditch or the dueling. Oh yeah, and there's also a multiplayer mode for dueling, which is a nice touch. And so that's it for the flagship version. I really appreciate all the quality of life improvements like the sprinting and the more accessible portrait shortcuts, and most importantly, the developers trimming down the sheer plethora of benign tasks and fetch quests. However, this does mean that the Half-Blood Prince is somewhat on the shorter side. But that's okay, right? Not every game needs to be Elder Scrolls. Personally, I think it's just long enough for you to enjoy the various new mechanics and gameplay. Although, I do understand why some people would find it repetitive. Because the vast majority of the game is just you walking from Quidditch to dueling to potions. 
Okay, so what about the other versions? Well, the PlayStation 2 version is almost identical, but compromises had to be made to compress this whole game down into a previous generation console. This means the textures take a real hit, especially the character faces. Everyone kind of looks like they're wearing a rubber mask in this version. Also, for some reason I just kept chucking the ingredients all over the place in the potion minigame. Okay, moving on, what about the Wii version? Well, in terms of graphics, this one sits somewhere in between the PlayStation 2 and 3. This being the Nintendo Wii, the controls had to be reworked to use motion and waggle. It is the law after all. So you fly by pointing the Wiimote at the screen, which actually works pretty well. As for the jewels, well, they're a waggle fest. But then we have the potions. This should have been a no-brainer, right? The Wiimote and Nunchuck are built for the potions minigame. No, first of all, you're going to have to break your wrist just to have to pour these potions into the cauldron, and you're going to spill them everywhere. But that's not even the hard part. You see, because next you're going to have to heat up the cauldron using this motion. Come on, come on, why don't you work? Screw Wii Fit, if you want to work out, just play the potions minigame. Come on, why won't you heat up? God, getting one of these potions brewed made me feel like one of those guys at the back of the Titanic shoveling coal into the engine. I'm going as hard as I can! <sighs> so this one section turns the Hoveblood Prince from a nice, chill game to this European extreme level of grueling workout. Right, moving on to the handhelds. So the last two PlayStation Portable games were ports of the console versions with visual downgrades, but by this point the console versions were just too much for the aging PSP to handle, so EA decided to make a completely separate game. And here it is! Yep, I know what you're thinking, it's definitely a visual downgrade from The Order of the Phoenix, but something this game does borrow a lot from its predecessor is the gameplay and pacing which is a long way of saying you're gonna spend most of this game running around Hogwarts doing fetch quests that turn into trading sequences that turn into more fetch quests. Yes, it does have potions and dueling and Quidditch, but they've been very much simplified. Also, these jewels with their sideways perspective and health bars definitely give me Mortal Kombat vibes. Finisher. This game also uses the same trick implemented by the Game Boy Advance and DS version of The Order of the Phoenix in recycling screenshots from the console version as pre-rendered backgrounds. I really don't know what else positive I can say about this version, it's really not a fun game. So why did they do this? Why go with such a downgrade? Surely the PSP can run a better game than this. It can, but the Nintendo DS can't. That's right, EA did a two for one because the PSP and the DS version of this game are near identical. The DS has a slightly lower resolution and the characters all have this thick outline. And of course, all the mini games and puzzles now utilize the touchscreen. But that's really it. And finally, we come to the mobile version. These ran on old phones that supported Java. And if you've ever looked at your Motorola E1000 and thought, you know what, this needs a walking simulator, then you're in luck because that's pretty much what these are. Every now and then the walking will be interrupted by having to move a cabinet or getting into a very basic duel. And just like with Order of the Phoenix, there were different versions of this game depending on your phone's spec. And so there we have it, every version of Harry Potter and the Hubblood Prince game. The handheld games are very much forgettable, but the console versions are definitely better than its predecessor, with the added gameplay elements and the quality of life improvements. However, this game is a bit short and tends to get repetitive. Now normally, I wouldn't have a problem with that. After all, these games have a very truncated development cycle. Only this game didn't. You see, because the Half-Blood Prince movie was actually delayed by 8 months, which meant the game was also delayed. So the developers actually had 2 years to put this game together instead of the usual year and a half. I know that's still not a huge amount of time, but I was definitely hoping they'd use the extra time to add more content. But by the looks of it, the extra eight months were mostly spent adding more bottles of dung and rad guts to the potion minigame. Thanks for watching. Please let me know what you thought about the Hubblood Prince game in the comments. Where does it rank amongst other Harry Potter games for you? Please remember to like, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow me on Twitter. See you next time.